Uh, so first of all, thanks everybody for, for being here. Uh, I know it's early and a special thanks to the organizers for allowing me to, uh, to participate. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Um, uh, so I'm going to be talking about locating uh, missing periods um, in our study area uh, in specific landscape contexts, um, and um, and how absence of evidence or negative evidence um, inspired us towards uh, using a, a geospatial approach and some of our preliminary results. Uh, yeah, okay, so a little bit about, about the research setting. Um, the project is run out of uh, the Sagalossus research project, the parent project, if you will. Um, and this is, uh, some of you may know the site, um, but for those that don't, we're in the, on the northern flanks of the western Taurus Mountains in southwest Turkey uh, in the Pisidian Lake District. So the, the Taurus Mountains run all along do we have a pointer? <coughs> that doesn't seem to work. No, you <laughs> <Okay>. So, <laughs> so right. all along the coast of Turkey, you have the Taurus Mountains, which uh, separate uh, the Mediterranean from the Central Anatolian Plateau. Uh, and we're right on the uh, northern cusp of that. Uh, Saglasas is uh, an antique site uh, from uh, the first earliest dates are um, in the Hellenistic, uh, and it goes to uh, the, the uh, mid uh, Byzantine. Um, but they've got uh, generally three decades worth of archaeological research and ecological research uh, in the territory, uh, which was a great data set for us to draw from. Um, so the project recognized from the early stages the importance of, of surveying to understand the context of the site uh, and to survey for all periods. Uh, in, the, in the early years, in the 90s, I'm oh, sorry. This is going to take a bit of coordination. <laughs> Give me a moment. So in the, uh, in the early years, in the 90s, uh, it was exclusively extensive surveys. So this was uh, driving uh, through the landscape, inter interviewing locals, what have you seen, um, reviewing historic records and maps and these sorts of things. Uh, but in the late 90s and early 2000s, they began intensive survey programs. Uh, so there were several separate, separate projects over the years. Uh, focusing in, in different areas, trying to get a good sample of the landscape. Uh, most recently, 2016 to 2017, myself and uh, my co-author on this paper, uh, Ralph Van Dam, we did a survey in the Highlands. Um, and the, the result of this, I don't know, what, you can see, I guess these, they're quite small, but we've 200 and identified 265 sites uh, throughout the territory. Uh, so quite a large number of sites, and it's a certainly only still a small fraction. But um, we find quite different archaeologies in different landscapes. And uh, for example, in the Buddha Plain, I'm going to use the example of comparing the Buddha Plain, um, which if I go back, Buddha Plain is here in green. Uh, the survey and the uh, Dergo Highlands is all the way on the western, on the uh, eastern side. Excuse me. Um, so, uh, a great uh, uh, degree of difference in elevation. Uh, the Buddha Plain is your typical <coughs> lowland, fertile, um, uh, alluvial setting that you expect to find a high degree, a, high, a large number of, of finds um, uh, in, an, in a place like Turkey. Uh, but surprisingly to everyone, we found quite a bit more in the highlands than in the lowlands. Um, and found periods which were t entirely absent or very poorly represented in the lowlands, uh, in the highlands. Um, so we, we recovered more material in two campaigns in the highlands than in three uh, in the Buddha Plain. And this, this is, the Buddha Plain is known for uh, sites like Hajalar and uh, Kurichai, <coughs> these famous uh, Neolithic and early Capolithic tell sites. Um, and when you compare the results from uh, the two, uh, you can see that having only focused on one or the other, you would miss entire periods. So you have the, uh, the Hellenistic, for example, which is well represented in the Buddha Plain, totally absent from the highlands, and the inverse is true for the late antique period. Uh, and the difference in, in Ottoman presence, for example, is also major. Um, 
And um, I don't have it on this, uh, unfortunately, but we found quite a bit of Middle Paleolithic stuff also in the highlands, which wasn't known in the, in the territory at all before our uh, survey in 2016. Uh, so you can see this, there, that there are several blank areas in one landscape or the other, which you'd be entirely unaware of had you not sampled the entire landscape or all separate landscape units. Um, so some possible exclamation, I mean, there, there can be many explanations for this, right? Uh, but some of the, the primary ones that I'll focus on, I think, are, are the diversity of the landscape of the Sagalossus territory. Um, you can see um, the extreme difference in elevation. So we have uh, across a very short distance, you go from the lowest of about 200 meters, mid 200 meters, to 2600, um, uh, just within 30 kilometers. Um, so local vegetation, hydrology, and topography have created all these separate little microecologies. And individual valleys are, are quite different from each other. Um, you can look at some of the photographs, and we have everything from steppic plains to um, badlands, and then bamboo grass and marshy areas, and then this oral Mediterranean uh, mountainscapes as well. So it's a really diverse territory. Uh, and uh, mean annual precipitation, for example, between Sagalassos and the Buder Plain, uh, there's more than, it's twice as high, precipitation is twice as high annually in Sagalassos and the Buder Plain, 30 kilometers away. And uh, there's a difference in, in annual uh, mean temperature of 5 degrees centigrade. So it's a very diverse landscape and you see quite a lot of variability. I think this has a big impact on, on what we see. The other is, of course, um, erosion and human impact that have affected uh, the visibility of remains. Right? What can we, what's being obscured by uh, the way the landscape has changed over time. Um, uh, the human activity on the hill slopes uh, has caused really extensive erosion in, in many of these valleys. Um, have tra they transported uh, sediments several meters thick in places. Uh, we know some of the, the Neolithic layers by dating um, cores that we've, that we've extracted, that the Neolithic labor layers in places are eight meters below the surface, the current surface now. So, and also material, of course, is transported uh, in this process as well. So, uh, obscuring uh, certain periods in certain places. But uh, grappling with these, these gaps in the record has sort of um, inspired us to take a different approach uh, at finding a way to target specific uh, periods and types of sites um, to help, you know, fulfill our, our research goals in general. Um, and that approach that we that we decided to use, utilize, uh, which was designed by my second co-author, um, uh, Chris Carlton et al., is known as LAMAP. And the um, the theory behind the map is that humans make land use decisions uh, based on by referencing mental archetypes, which come from practice, tradition, social memory, um, and that uh, the archetypes are basically schematics uh, which depict to them optimal locations for given activities, whether it's clay sourcing or flint napping or uh, building a homestead or campsite, uh, and that there's an inherent proximate bias in this. Right, it's, it's relative to the space around you. So you're not thinking of the best campsite possible. It's what is best in this area. Maybe a rubbish campsite 50 kilometers away, but this is the best one available to you uh, at the time. So this, there's an inherent proximate bias in this, and the model accounts for that. Um, in terms of calculation, um, the basis is these empirical frequency distributions. So we start with the training data set. The training data set is, is the database of all the known sites. Uh, their locations, their period, their size, um, and uh, a selection of predictor variables uh, which the researcher determines, which, it, which we think are the important uh, factors uh, which are affecting uh, settlement choice. So we started with a basic set. I should say that this, is our, we, this was our first run this summer. I'm, I'm fresh from the field, so we have um, only preliminary results, but uh, what we, this can be tweaked over time. So the, the, the variables that we chose to use were elevation, slope, aspect, convexity, proximity to drainage uh, as landscape variables, and then cultural variables for certain periods, such as proximity to least cost paths or proximity to urban centers, proximity to Roman roads, roads et cetera. Um, and then these variables, the values for these variables are extracted using uh, the GIS, uh, which, from which we derive the multivariate 
distribution traits for each known site. Uh, the output is a map, uh, a roster image, where, which each cell, which each pixel um, is compared to these uh, multivariate distributions for each, uh, each cell is compared to the multivariate distributions for each known site. So you're making, compar you're making comparisons and uh, the result is probabilities of, of a cohesion, um, which are combined and weighted and they give us a number which represents archeological potential. So here's some of the uh, surfaces, the predictive surfaces that we generated to show you an example of how they differ. Um, the top left, oh sorry. The top left is, uh, is the uh, late prehistoric uh, predictive surface and the, uh, then the top right is a Hellenistic. Uh, bottom left we have uh, late antique and the bottom right is Ottoman. So you can see there's quite a bit of variability. Um, you see that the bottom left and top right are much more constricted, and this is because it's, it's an interpolative model and we use a factor like proximity to urban centers, so it's bound by the extent of urban centers. Um, but if you were to zoom in on one of these images uh, very closely in a GIS, you see that although some areas look entirely white or entirely dark, when you get up close, there's quite a range of, of, of variability, uh, even from one cell to the next. So our methodology, the way we went into the field, the way we worked with the models, or were to select cells uh, with the goal of achieving um, uh, a representative sample of each LMAP class. So uh, in addition to uh, seven uh, models, one for each uh, of major period that we have, of the ones I showed you. We also produce an aggregate uh, model, which combined all of them to give us an aggregate score, uh, which was 0 through 35. Um, these are the LAMAP classes, 0 through 35, uh, 35 representing the highest archaeological potential, uh, 0 obviously the lowest. Uh, and for each class, each individual period, it's a 1 through 5. So we had the task, which was quite a challenge to um, to try to get at least one from each uh, LMAP class of the 35 uh, and then if we got one then we try to get two, if we got two try to get three uh, and at the same time to try to get uh, zero through five represented for each period. So it was, it was, it was it, I spent hours in the lab in the evening after surveying all day trying to plan out the, the survey for the next day. In the future, I think we'd like to try to find a way to, to uh, create an algorithm or something which we can automate that. Um, but uh, we tried our best, and in the end, uh, we were able to, to survey 93 cells, um, which I think was quite good uh, in the time that we had. Uh, the cells were selected to, from a diverse range of landscapes. We, we tried to get lows, mids, and highs from each different landscape unit that we have. Um, and uh, each cell was then uh, intensively surveyed. I have an image here, this is our survey methodology. Um, and uh, so uh, we used a total collection strategy and each shirt collected was dated by our on-site specialist um, to within the LMAP uh, uh, ranges of time. So uh, some of our preliminary results, like I said, this is the beginning, but uh, the bar graph here shows the ratio of, of positive plots to the total number of plots for each LMAP class uh, for each time period. The height of each bar is effectively the empirical probability of finding something giving a, give a LMAP class. Um, since the, the, the ratios are higher for high LMAP classes, we can conclude that the predictive model is generally working across uh, all time periods. Though some periods appear to be better than others, um, it should be noted that despite our best efforts, obviously, and I, I described that we limited time and, and a complicated uh, survey planning process meant that we, we couldn't get complete coverage. Uh, for each class field, um, so we don't have even sampling across all the map classes um, for each time period, but the results um, are also complemented by the fact that some periods are, are they're better represented in the archaeological record than others. So some periods are just harder to find in general, which weighs the model down. Uh, for example, the Iron Age is quite difficult for us to find at all. Um, so uh, it bring, it's bringing these totals down, which are the aggregate totals. Um, you can see here also in these um, and these plots, which show the same basic trend, these are um, uh, showing the, the number of finds. Okay, so this is not just presence, absence, uh, but numbers of finds. And they're showing also generally that, aside from some outliers, that it's working uh, fairly well. 
So two preliminary statistic mo models have been created to explore the survey results. Uh, logic regression model, uh, which involves a binary outcome. This is the presence absence. Uh, it estimates that the effect given the predictor variables has on the odds of a positive outcome. Uh, and the Poisson regression model, which involves the count-based outcome. Um, and it estimates the impact given by predictor variables on that count. So for our analysis, the LMAP classes were used as a predictor variable. Uh, the question we're trying to answer is, do higher LMAP classes mean uh, improved odds of finding something, a presence in the legit model, or finding more stuff, the Poisson model? Uh, for this initial analysis, uh, we didn't treat each period separately. Instead, we looked at it in aggregate. Uh, and for both models, we used a generalized linear regression uh, and uh, AIC um, uh, to select the models. We compared the AICs in each case uh, to corresponding models that let the LMAP class variable uh, out of the equation. Uh, and so models that used uh, in only an intercept, the, the mean, to predict the, the outcome, and compared that to the um, AICs from the models with using the LMAP variables. And we found that the LMAP variable results were much better. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Uh, here you can see uh, in the end, uh, an in one unit increase in the map for us in our territory showed if you go from a one to a two, you get a 27% higher chance of finding something, presence, absence. A four unit increase would give you uh, uh, an improved odds by 161% that you find something. Um, a one unit increase in the map class uh, also corresponds to a 50% higher increase in the number of finds. Uh, so going into the field with this in hand, I think uh, would give us a much uh, better results in terms of, uh, in a large territory, finding missing periods. Uh, future analyses, we've got many plans, how we want to go forward with it, uh, things we can do. Um, I'll try to wind up here, but um, uh, including uh, new, new survey data, looking at different variables and the effect each variable had, uh, and uh, trying to tweak a little bit and see how we can uh, get the model to produce the exact results which we had. This is an image of our aggregate model, so you can see what the aggregate model looked like for the territory, uh, just to give you an idea, and, uh, and that, is, uh, that is it. Great, thank you.